important. So anyway, um, let's start. Open your Bibles with me tonight to John 16, 7, and I'm going to pray over this precious word before we get started. Father, thank you so much for the anointing that rests upon your word. Always when your word goes forth, people are set free. I ask for the Holy Spirit's help tonight, for his guidance, his revelation. I thank you that he'll speak through my lips and think through my mind. We welcome him in this place. We thank you for giving him to us for this day and this hour. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So John 16, 7 says this. Nevertheless, Jesus is talking. I tell you the truth. It is expedient or better for you that I go away. If I don't go away, the comforter will not come onto you, onto you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is they refuse to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to my Father, and you will see me no more. Judgment will come before because the ruler, Satan, of this world has already been judged. That's good news. Already been judged. So, verse 12, Jesus said, There is so much more I want to tell you, but you can't bear it now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you whatever he receives from me. This is Jesus speaking. Okay, so before we get into the 10 things, I'm just going to explain really quick that there's, you know, there's the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And there's three different dispensations. So God the Father's dispensation was pretty much in the Old Testament. Even though Jesus and the Holy Spirit was all over those pages, right? But God the Father's dispensation was the Old Testament. The New Testament was Jesus' dispensation. Even though we saw the Holy Spirit ascend upon him when he got baptized. We see him talking and speaking of the Father constantly, right? But it was Jesus' dispensation. Through the book of Acts and on the epistles and still today, the dispensation is of the Holy Spirit. So we're dealing with the Holy Spirit. It's his dispensation, even though he gets his instructions from Jesus, who gets them from the Father. They're one, right? Okay, so one day I was thinking about this. Actually, you know, I'm reading through the Bible again in a year, and oh my goodness, I don't know about y'all. When you read some of these Old Testament stories, like I just got done with Leviticus, praise the Lord, and... um, And every time I read it, I gain a little bit more understanding. Of course, it helps that I constantly am asking Pastor Bonnie, what does this mean? And why is it so important for us to have all of these facts? But I don't know if you've ever thought this. When you read about the men and women of old, don't you just think about the day when we get to heaven or days when we're in heaven about what it's going to be like when we see Adam or Abraham or Moses, what would we ask them? What would I ask Esther and Deborah? And and what would we ask the disciples? Like, would we say, what was it like to walk in the garden? Or Moses, what was it like to, to hear God from a burning bush? I mean, when's the last time you saw a burning bush? You know, we always pray for burning bush experiences. We don't need them. So let me tell you something. Do you know what they're going to ask you? They're going to ask you, what was it like to have the spirit of God living on the inside of you? 
Because let me tell you, in those days, in the, in the Old Testament days, they heard the voice of God. God spoke to them, but they heard the voice of God through prophets. There was always a leader that God gave instruction to, and it was through the prophet. And do you know that there was times and seasons where he was silent? Not so today. Not so. He's living within us. He's living upon us. And these great men of old are going to say, what was that like? What a privilege. What a privilege we have to have the Holy Spirit today. All right, I, I got saved when in 1977. Shortly thereafter, in early 1978, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And my life changed drastically when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. When, when um, Jesus told him that he was leaving, the scripture that we just read in John, the disciples were filled with sadness. Do you know that they didn't even ask Jesus where he was going? They were so filled with grief that he was leaving Right? They didn't even ask. I'm sure we would be too, right? If we walked with the master for three years and served him and listened to his parables and his stories and saw signs and miracles coming from him, right? We, we would probably feel that same way. But Jesus shocked him with what he said. He was saying to them that having the Holy Spirit with them and in them, is better. Better than having him physically here. That's what he said. He said, it is expedient that I go. It is better for you that I go so the Holy Spirit can come. He said it was better. Jesus said it. I didn't. Right? It's better for us that we have the Holy Spirit, even though it would be great to have Jesus physically. But Jesus, though he was God, was still a man. So he could, he, he, even though he could get to other places pretty quickly, he, he wasn't everywhere, right? He is now. This is why it's better. So Jesus shocked him. He said, I tell you the truth. This is the truth. As hard as it is to understand, the ministry of the Holy Spirit of the life of the believer is better than the earthly ministry of Jesus physically here on the earth. Having him in his physical body, it's better. Jesus said it's better that you have the Holy Spirit with us and in us than to have him physically here. Okay, Matthew 28, 20 says... It seems impossible then that um, he would say, now he said this when he was ascended up to heaven, but it, it would seem impossible that he would say, I am with you even to the end of the world. And as he was sending into heaven, I will always, lo, I will always be with you. How could he say that? He said it because he knew, I'm sending you the Holy Spirit. And he's going to live within you and upon you. And because of that, I'll be with you forever. All of you. Not just when I'm on the sea or not just when I'm in Capernaum or not just when I'm in Galilee or not when I'm just by the seashore. I'm going to be with you always. Okay, so reason number one, we need the Holy Ghost in our life every day. Number one, we are... Are, it will read out of John 3. We are born of the Spirit. We're born of the Spirit. Jesus said three times in this verse of Scripture that we have to be born of the Spirit. We have to be. So this is what it says. John 3, verses 5 through 8. Jesus answered Nicodemus. He came to him and he said, What must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. In other words, humans produce humans. 
That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That means the Holy Spirit gives birth to our spiritual life. Jesus says, marvel not that I say this to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wills and you hear the sound of the wind, but you can't tell where it's going. So everyone who is born of the Spirit, so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit would not have come, none of us would have ever, ever been able to be born again. Born of the Spirit. John 7, 38 says, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Living water. Out of his belly. You, we must, in this day, recognize the important role the Holy Spirit has in our salvation. Okay, so when you were born again, because you were born again, it was, it was because Jesus came, died on the cross, and left and sent the Holy Spirit. And now he lives inside of you in the form of the Holy Spirit forever. Galatians 4, 6 says, God sent forth the Spirit of his Son, the Spirit of Jesus, into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Some people have a hard time believing this because they can't see him or feel him all the time. Romans 8, 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, so the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So, if you, if you think because you don't feel or, or see or understand that Jesus or the spirit of Jesus lives in of you, on resurrection morning, two disciples were walking on their way to Emmaus. They had heard that Jesus rose from the dead. They heard it, but they hadn't seen it yet. So they were on their way uh, walking, and um, Luke 24, 13 says, when they had heard the reports of Jesus being raised from the dead, they were struggling to believe it. And all of a sudden, as they were walking, the resurrected Jesus, the resurrected king, came beside them and started talking to them. But they did not recognize him. Not at first. And so he talked to them about how he had to die and, and raise, raise up on the third day and, and why that was so important. And <clears throat> they did not recognize that it was Jesus. For miles he walked with them. Guys, for miles. And we think, oh, well, I don't really recognize him. But it was when they broke bread with him. They sat, they fellowshiped, they broke bread. They realized, oh, this is Jesus. Friends, if this could happen to the disciples who walked with Jesus for three years, they knew him, it's going to happen to us. But how, how do we get to know and feel and know that he lives on the inside of us? It's only through fellowship with him, only through that we realize his presence is with us now. So anyway, let's move forward. Um, in addition to the Holy Spirit coming to live on the inside of us when we are born again, we also have an experience of the Spirit upon. Spirit within, Spirit upon. Two separate experiences. And we're going to talk about that later. We're going to get to it, the fifth reason. Um, and I want to spend a lot of time on that, so... I need to um, do this quickly. But number three and four kind of go together. Number three, the reason why we need the Holy Spirit is for revelation knowledge. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man, the natural mind, the natural man, cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Have you ever, ever had hurt anybody tell you that when they see or hear of the miracles or the, the uniqueness of the Holy Ghost, that it's foolish? 
It's because natural thinking, natural man, say it's foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are not spiritually discerned. When the two men walked with Jesus for miles on the road to Emmaus, they even said later, they asked this question, did our hearts not burn within us while we walked, while he walked with us in the way? Did our hearts not burn? Yet they did not recognize him. How in the world do you think we got this precious Bible, this precious book? It's from the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that scriptures are inspired by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit told the men of old what to say, how to write it. Listen to me. If you read <clears throat> Leviticus and Numbers, it's God speaking almost the whole time. And guess what Moses is doing? Okay, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said, God said. He wrote it down. How? Inspired by the Spirit of God. God said, they wrote it down. Inspired by the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> the, spy, the Bible is the inspired Word of God by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual things can only be revealed to us by the Holy Spirit. Prior to our infilling of the Holy Spirit, we're dull to it. Um, I don't know, maybe before you were saved or maybe right when you were saved, you opened up the Bible and it didn't make sense to you. You didn't understand it. And the more you got to know the Lord or got filled with the Holy Ghost, all of a sudden, revelation knowledge began to flow into you you begin to understand it. We can't figure out the Bible in our natural mind. But then the Holy Spirit helps us to remember, which is the kind of three and four that go together. We receive revelation knowledge and remembrance. I love this verse of scripture. I depend upon it a lot. For, uh, John 14, 26 says, the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, who the Father will send in my name. Jesus is speaking. He will teach you all things. He'll teach you all things. And bring all things to your remembrance. And he'll remind you of everything that I have told you. I pray this a lot of times. Holy Spirit, I need your help today. Teach me, do you, are you ever called to do stuff that one, you don't know how to do, two, you're not comfortable doing? It's just something you just don't like to do? I always say, Holy Spirit, help me. Teach me. Guide me. Or how about you forget? Holy Spirit, help me to remember. Cause me to remember. We need the Holy Spirit to help us in this day. To teach us all things. To bring to remembrance, to remind us. He reminds us of the goodness of God in our life. <clears throat> our understanding is only opened through the Holy Spirit. Okay, so... Uh, he will teach us all things, not just some things. I love that. All right, so number five, and I'm going to stay on this for quite some time because it's important. All of it is important. But we need the Holy Spirit in our life because the Bible says we receive power. And we're going to read, <clears throat> this is when Jesus had resurrected. He walked on the earth for about 40 days in his resurrected body. Imagine that. Actually, when Jesus was resurrected, some other dead people were resurrected. And they walked around. Right, Pastor Monty? Yeah. Got to make sure I have all those facts straight. So some other dead people was resurrected. And they started walking around with him. What a sight. So Jesus was with the disciples for about, or the people, people, anybody who would follow him, for about 40 days. About 500 people 
uh, was with him this day when he said in Acts 1, verse 4 through 8, The Bible says, being assembled together, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. He commanded them to go to Jerusalem and wait. And you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The scriptures that we read before talks about this, the Spirit comes within you. That's the new birth. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and you shall be witnesses unto me in both Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth. That's us. We're the uttermost parts. After saying this, he was taken up in a cloud and they watched him until they could not see him anymore. And out of 500 people, only 120 went to Jerusalem and waited. Only 120 out of 500 people. Now, these were the last words of Jesus in his resurrected body, his last words. Do you not know that usually the last words are the most important? Or they're important. They're pretty important, don't you think? How many times don't we say when our kids are running out of the house, don't forget your coat. Don't forget your bag. Don't you say to your husband, don't forget the kids. <laughs> right? Most important. Last thing, last words. These are very important words, Jesus said. Very important and he commanded them to go to Jerusalem and wait until the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would receive power. All right, so they went and they waited. I would like to know what they did because they waited for approximately 10 days. Well, it was 10 days because of Passover. That's how we know that it was 10 days because it said, when Passover... And so he was here 40 days, Passover's 50 days, so about 10 days. So don't you think, wouldn't you, like after day one, day two, day three, day four, wouldn't you think, I mean, surely they had to eat. Surely they were like, they knew they were waiting for the Holy Ghost. They just didn't know what it would be like, right? They had no idea. They just know we're, we're just going to obey our Lord. Day five, day six, what were they talking about? What were they doing? I know they were waiting, preparing, praying, praising. I'm sure they were doing all of that, right? And day 10, when Pentecost, suddenly, suddenly, I love suddenlies. Suddenly, it happened. Acts 2, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place, the upper room. We go visit there. When we go to Israel, it's, it's the most amazing um, feeling to go to the place where they were gathered together. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven like a mighty windstorm. Pa the Passion Bible says a violent blast of wind rushing into the house from out of the heavenly realm. Wow. But then, verse 3, then appeared to them a divided tongue as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. Fire, fire sat on each of them. I don't know about you, but what would you do if you're in a room and all of a sudden you hear a huge wind like the sound of a tornado Wind coming from heaven. Oh, my watch. Just wanting to know how they can help me. <laughs> how can I help you? Well, um, anyway, and then fire sat on them. Fire. Tongues of fire. 
and everyone was filled, everyone, all 120, including the mother of, Mary, of Jesus, Mary. She was there. All of them was filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit, Holy Spirit, gave them utterance. I kind of think that if the church started with fire, the church still needs fire in this day. If it started with it, we, we need it today. We want a church that is touched by God with fervent, passion, fire. We want that. Speaking in tongues has not ceased, as some believe. It was not just for the day of Pentecost. It happened throughout the Acts and the New Testament, constantly. You read all through it. It wasn't just for Pentecost. And the people who say, well, it died out with the apostles. I, no, let me tell you something. I want to know the exact last pot apostle that spoke in tongues. And I want to know why God would say, the buck stops right here. Nobody else is going to get it. You know why I know our father wouldn't do that? Because he's not a respecter of persons. And if he told the disciples and the followers back then to wait in Jerusalem until they were endued with power, then he knew we would need it too all these 2,000 years later. And we need it. So praying in tongues is the doorway to the supernatural. That's why it's so important for us, guys. This is important. It is the doorway to the supernatural. It's the language of the supernatural. It's his language. No wonder the devil has fought so hard, so hard to keep it from believers by lying to them. The Greek word for power in this scripture is called dunamis. 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 We get our word dynamite from it means miraculous, miracle-working power. So when you're endued with power, you're endued with dunamis. You're endued with dynamite, which is miracle-working power. Even the Sanhedrin, when they saw the disciples' boldness, they took note and said, I think they've been with Jesus. Even though they were against Jesus, they're like, wow, I think they've been with Jesus. After those, those disciples received the Holy Spirit, their lives were changed. You know how I know that? When you read what happened right after. Now, now think about this, 40 days, Jesus, so about 50-some days prior, the disciples were scattered, 55, scattered, Right? So I'm going to tell you how they were before and then how they were after. And this is what happens in our life too. All right, so before, the disciples were fearful. This is when Jesus was getting, uh, he got arrested, crucified. They were scattered and they were fearful. They were running for their lives because they thought, well, they're, they're going to want to arrest us too. After, they were bold. Before, they denied Jesus. After, they proclaimed Jesus. Before, they were timid and shy. After, they were empowered. Before, they were limited by their flesh. After, they were spiritually gifted. I think we could use some of this boldness today. Don't you? We need this boldness. The spirit of the Antichrist is in this world today. We should not and ought not be timid and shy. Amen. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to give us supernatural power, just like they did. Allow him to do it. We need his supernatural power. After they were filled with the Holy Ghost and all these people come running because they heard the big sound, right? They heard it all. And all these people come running and they start accusing them of being drunk. Of course, it was 9 o'clock in the morning. And so Peter, I love this because it says, and, and you know, I, I just love Peter. 
um, even though his mouth got him in trouble and, and you know, he, it, but, but he, the Bible says that he stepped forward. He stepped away and he preached. 55 days earlier, Peter denied knowing Jesus. But then he gets endued with power to be a witness and he preached a bold sermon. Preached it. You know, you know what he said? This Jesus whom you crucified has now risen from the death and uh, from the dead, and we're all witnesses to it. So repent and get saved. Right now, 3,000 people gave their life to the Lord that day because Peter was bold. What did that? The Holy Spirit inside of him. The Holy Spirit did. I wonder if the reason why people resist the ministry of the Holy Spirit is because it exposes the lack of power in their lives. And if it would expose that lack of power, it would demand change. And that's hard. So I uh, heard my friend actually gave me this survey of spirit-filled believers, a survey taken with spirit-filled believers. I was shocked at this um, survey. And it's this. <coughs> Excuse me. No. <coughs> 15% of spirit-filled believers say they... <coughs> Excuse me. 15, only 15% pray in tongues every day. Only 9% pray in tongues once a month. 7% pray in tongues once a week. 49% of all spirit-filled believers say they never pray in tongues. How can it be? Why? <clears throat> I'm shocked. It shouldn't be. So we're going to talk about a little bit what is so important about praying in tongues. Why is it so important? Why do people stay away from it? Why do people not pray in the Holy Spirit? If Jesus thought it was so important that it was his last instructions to us, his last instructions to the disciples to wait until they were endued with power, wait until the Spirit of God came upon them and filled them with the Holy Ghost so they all spoke with tongues, then it is important for us. This is not a one-time experience either. It is not a one and done. The scriptures say that we need to be, be being filled continually, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is it so important to pray in tongues? Number one, praying in tongues is the outward sign of being filled with the Holy Spirit. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, the sign that follows it is to pray in tongues. Number two, praying in the Spirit filled us with boldness to be a witness. If you're not bold to witness to somebody, if you don't find that you have the boldness to tell people about Jesus, Maybe you're not praying in tongues. Acts 2.14 says, When Peter heard that some accused him of being drunk, he stepped forward and he said, Listen carefully to me. Make no mistake about this. We are not drunk as you suppose. We are not drunk as you suppose, which I had already referred to Peter. He talked about, <clears throat> I didn't say this, but Peter said, This was prophesied. The Jews knew this. This was prophesied by the prophet Joel, Peter said. That was part of his sermon too. Oh, I love this. It says this, that Peter preached long and strong. I love that. He preached long and strong. Sounds like somebody else I know. <laughs> <laughs> 
That was for a special occasion, though. <laughs> anyway, the prophet Joel said, in the last days, and we are in the last of the last of the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Upon who? All people, not some, not just you and you and the rest of you don't get it. All people, I'll pour out my spirit. And your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I'll cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. I like the wonders. Signs and wonders. Other examples constantly throughout Acts. We won't take the time. Um, you know, Paul talks. Paul says, I wish you prayed in tongues more. more. I wished... Y'all prayed in tongues more than me. Okay. The baptism of the Holy Ghost was not just for the day of Pentecost. Praying in the Spirit makes us more conscious of him living in us. It makes us conscious of him. Number three, praying in tongues increases our sensitivity to his voice on the inside. Now, I suppose you can pray in tongues and not pay attention. I suppose you can just, just pray and, and your mind isn't hooked up with it. But I think as we go and see how important praying in tongues is and what it does do, you won't be doing that anymore. Since he lives on the inside of us, he does not need the burning bush. And actually, the Bible says it's a still small voice most of the time. We should ignore, ignore it. We should get to know it. We should get to know that voice. It's like praying in tongue fine tunes our spirit to recognize his voice and enables us to follow his will. He like fine tunes it. You know how we use Siri all the time for directions? We use Siri to take us to the mall or to a restaurant. We're like, hey, Siri, help us to find. And, and a lot of times, I, I have to say this, that I usually use Siri and, and give him the directions. He argues with her all the time. <laughs> like he debates. I don't think that's right. I just don't think that's right. I'm like, it's Siri for crying out loud. But they've, the GPS and Siri has been known to be wrong. Have you ever pulled in? Not always. <laughs> Have you ever pulled in? Like it's like your destination is on the right and you're out in the middle of nowhere and there's a cow out there and it says your destination is on the right. It's like I think you're wrong. Right? But guess what? The Holy Ghost is our GPS. The Holy Ghost is our Siri, and he will never lead us wrong. He will never, ever direct us or guide us in the wrong path. Never. He is our GPS. Okay, number four. When we pray in other tongues, we are speaking divine mysteries unto God. Divine mysteries. 1 Corinthians 14.2 says, Since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. But it will be mysteries. It will be a secret. Now, this kind of praying is not prophecy. Prophecy is a gift of the Spirit, and that's a whole other sermon. The, the nine gifts of the Spirit. So this is not prophecy. The Bible says when somebody prophesies in other tongues, you need an interpretation. Don't get so hung up when you are praying in another tongue, speaking mysteries to God, and you don't understand it. It's a secret. And if the Holy Spirit wants you to know that secret, he'll reveal it to you, and he does many times. If you listen to him, he will reveal it. I love this. I heard somebody say, we get so hung up on it. Like, well, I don't understand it. What good is it? Because you're speaking mysteries unto God. Mysteries. Secrets. 
but somebody, I heard somebody say this. I don't know where I, I heard it, but I loved it. Uh, it says, when you pray in the, other, in, in the spirit, you can either delay it, minimize it, or stop it altogether. And you don't know. You don't know what exactly you are praying for, but the Heavenly Father does. And the Holy Spirit helps you when you pray. And sometimes he lets you in on the secret. And sometimes he lets you know that you're delaying it, minimizing it, or stopping something. Number five, praying in tongues helps us to pray for other people. Romans 8, 26, 27 in the Amplified says, He comes to our aid and he bears us up in our weakness, for we don't know how we should pray as we ought. We don't know how to pray. Did you ever do that? This really just happened to me the other day. I was praying for a group of people, actually, and I named them. I said, I pray for, and I named them. And I just stopped. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to pray for them or what they needed or, you know, if we have a prayer request, we know what to pray. If somebody needs healing, then, okay, you know, I pray for Dana and then I find scriptures that have to do with healing because Dana needs healing. So I pray for Dana. I thank you, Father, that you sent your word to heal Dana. By Jesus' stripes, Dana is healed. Healed. I thank you, Father, that the healing virtue of God will flow through his body from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. But you're praying for a group of people that you really don't know what you should be praying about. The Holy Spirit himself. He helps us when we don't know how we should pray as we ought. He helps us. I'm so thankful for the Holy Ghost. He, be, he comes to our aid. He bears us up in our weakness. The Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings, prays with us with groanings that cannot be uttered or expressed in words. And the Father knows all hearts. And he knows what the Spirit is saying. Again, if the Holy Spirit is helping you pray and you don't always understand it, know the Father does. And sometimes, I'm telling you, more times than not, the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. He will. 1 Corinthians 14, 4 says, A person who speaks in tongues... Oh, here's another. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I skipped something. Number six is a person... Um, who prays in tongues, builds up their inner man. This is why it's important. Every day, every day, every day. Not once a month, not ever. Every day, we should be praying in tongues. I mean, from crying out loud, just pray in tongues during the shower. Pray in tongues when you're in the car. But pray in tongues. The Bible says it builds you up on your most holy faith. Jude one twenty says, Beloved, Building yourself up in your most holy faith by praying, by praying, by praying in the Holy Ghost. By praying in the Holy Ghost. Build yourself up by praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. A person who speaks in other tongues strengthens himself. Strengthens himself. It's kind of like exercise. Builds muscle, I think. <laughs> it makes you strong, right? Exercise, it's good. It builds you up, right? So does praying in tongues. It makes you strong. It builds you up. It is like plugging into a power source. When your phone dies or your computer dies, you don't throw it away, you don't put it to the side, you plug it in. You recharge the battery. Well, God is our power source. We plug into him and he charges us 
up. Love that about him. Okay. Uh, number seven, praying in tongues gets us through hard times. Gets us through hard times. Oh, yes, it does. <sighs> we will have hard times. We're going to have hard times. You might get knocked down a time or two. You might stay down a little bit too long. But it's really important that we get back up. But James 5, 13, I read this in different translations. And I read my, um, my commentary, which is really good to have in a study Bible. But James 5, 13 gives us instructions that says, If any among you, not different translations, say things like suffer hardships. If you're afflicted, pray. And pray in the Holy Ghost. Okay? It's different than if any is sick among you. If any is sick among you, pray for the elders of the church that they may anoint your head and lay hands on you and you will be healed. And the Father in heaven will forgive you of your sins. So afflicted here means suffering hardships. It said you pray. So I'm telling you, when you're having a hard time, a hard season, and, and you don't understand it, or you wonder why, pray. Pray. Something we need to do is to pray until we get a breakthrough. And I think that's where Christians kind of come up short because they don't pray to get a breakthrough or get a place of victory. Pray until you get a place of victory. Okay, and then eight, and that's um, the last one that I'm going to give you, even though there's several more of why it's important that we pray in tongues every day. This is why we need the Holy Spirit every day in our lives. Praying in tongues helps us praise God. Now, we can praise God perfectly by uh, speaking in English, singing in English, you know, praying in English. This, we can praise God that way. We can pray in English. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, but there is something about singing and praising the Lord in the spirit. I don't know if you've ever been in a service where the whole service went in that direction where everybody was praying in the spirit and there was such unison, there was such um, power. I remember, now, this, this happened to us many times um, in services, especially when he led the worship more. Um, it, it's a little bit harder when somebody else is leading the worship. But I'm going to tell you about this one time we were in my sister's house. I've shared this story before because I, I, it was supernatural. It was supernatural. We were in my sister's kitchen, and it was my sister, her husband, my other sister and her husband, and Monty and I. That's who was there. And um, he was on the guitar, and we started singing, just singing praise and worship songs. I don't know how long we sang in English, but after a while, we all started singing in, in the spirit. Spiritual songs. The Bible says spiritual songs, hymns, right? making melody in your heart to the Lord. So we sang, I can't even tell you hours, right, Monty? So much so that the finger, his fingers from playing the guitar, it was hours, right, hours. So much so, and, and nobody got tired of it. We were singing, we were praising the Lord, we were worshiping the Lord, and, uh, and we were in unison. It's amazing until 
The glory of God filled the place. The glory cloud came down in that kitchen to where we couldn't see anything else but the glory of God, which is the manifested presence of God, was in that place. Now, you don't think that when you praise the Lord like that and the glory of the Lord comes down in that way, that needs don't get met, miracles don't happen, answers don't come your way. But we worship the Lord that way. Many times we would have services that way. I remember when with my pastor, when he was the worship leader in Illinois with my pastor, um, Alfonso was his name, and he would constantly say, I don't know how many times, keep it going, Monte. He would call him Monte. Keep it going, Monte. Keep it going. And pretty soon he would just pray in the spirit. One time to where the whole church was praying in the spirit. He gets up from the piano. He doesn't know that he's getting up from the piano. And he runs around the piano, but the piano is on the edge of the stage. Telling you the truth. He runs around the piano, runs off the stage in midair and back on the stage. Without falling. He didn't even know he was doing it. He was praising the Lord. Well, of course, those that had their eyes open saw that. And uh, he didn't know what was happening. The place erupted. Many, many, many services like that. So important, so important uh, that we pray in tongues every day, that we depend on the Holy Ghost every day. So I want to take this time and, you know, um, I don't know that everybody here is not filled with the Holy Spirit. I don't know. Um, or maybe at one time you did ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit, but you never spoke in tongues. Or maybe you did speak in tongues, but you've never spoken tongues since. We want to pray for you tonight. We want you to be able to receive the infilling of the Holy Spirit so your life can be changed. You can be endued with power. And you can be have the power to be a witness, and you can pray in tongues. So... Let's pray, and if you would like prayer, Monty and I will both pray with you. Um, we would love to pray with you, and the Bible says when we lay hands on you to be filled with the Holy Spirit, you will be filled. It's that simple. Amen? Father God, thank you so much for your word tonight. I so appreciate the Spirit of God and the importance that he has in our life every day. We need him. We need him. So, Father, I pray for each and every person that's here, and if there'd be anyone that's never been filled with the Holy Spirit, never, ever had the evidence of speaking with tongues, I pray, Father, that they're open to receive the Holy Spirit into their life because it's so important for them to have it. Father, I thank you that you meet everyone's needs in this place. I pray for every sick body. I pray the healing virtue of God flows through them. I, th I thank you, Father God, that you are here to meet people's needs. I pray that you uh, provide every financial need that a person might have in this place. And Father, thank you so much for filling people with the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, if you um, would like us to pray with you, come on up and we'll pray um, with you. I think I can see that, yeah. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes. Um, if you, if you want to talk to us later, that'll be fine too. But I think it's great if we do it corporately. So if, um, if nobody wants to come forward, has everybody been filled with the Holy Spirit in this place? Yeah? Everybody speaks in tongues. No? <laughs> okay. If you haven't, you need to. So we'll help you. It's nothing to be afraid of. 
The Holy Spirit has no fear in him. So if you would like to come, come. We will pray with you, and, um, and you will be filled. Did you want to come? Yes. Come on. <laughs> be bold. <laughs> Monty, why don't you come up and pray too? Would you like to come? Okay. Yeah. You too? Okay. Yeah. Can we pray over all these? Okay. Okay. Well, all right. You all been born again, though. Yes. That's right. Okay. Thank you, Father. I want you to, you know, you know how when someone has a gift, they 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 receive that gift for so long. Yes. You know how many times you've had a gift for a while? Yeah. Yes. That's right. Thank you. So 